Woosa, wake up South Africa. Woosa, wake up South Africa. You've been sleeping far too long. Wake up South Africa. Now come along and sing this song. Wake up South Africa. Hare Krishna to all of you devotees uh, and Hare Krishna to um, our guest speaker today, His Grace Chaitanya Charan. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances and all glories to Prabhupada. My name is Mkosingake Ndawonde and I will, I've been honored with um, the grace to lead everyone throughout this morning's program. Um, so our guest speaker today, um, like I said, His Grace Chaitanya Charan is a monk, mentor and spiritual author. Uh, seeing the current problems of stress, depression, addiction and overall misdirection, he felt inspired to dedicate his life to the cause of sharing spiritual wisdom. He travels all over the world from Australia to America, giving talks on spiritual subjects in universities such as Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, and Cambridge, and companies such as Google, such as Intel, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. He is a prolific writer. He is the author of the world's only Gita daily feature, wherein he writes a daily 300-word inspirational reflection on a verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Till now, he has written over 4,000 Gita meditations that are posted on www.gitadaily.com. His articles have been published in many Indian national newspapers, including Indian Express, Economic Times, and Times of India. If all this is not enough, he is the author of 25 books. So we are extremely, extremely honored and blessed to have such a prolific speaker this morning. Uh, before we start, I would just like to go through a few house rules. Um, please kindly switch and keep your cameras on uh, so that we may have a welcoming and personal session. All mics to be muted and to be remain muted until um, quarter past um, South African Standard Time. Um, for questions and comments, please raise your hand to be unmuted and feel free to type your questions uh, and comments on YouTube and Facebook or in the Zoom chat panel as we go along. And then at the end of the chat, they will then be attended to. Um, thank you so very much. Uh, uh, Chaitanya Prabhu, uh, over to you. Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. Grateful to be here with all of you today. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Jnana Anjana Shalakaya 
चक्षुरोन्मील तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नमा विष्णुपदा कृष्णपृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी इति नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातरिणे वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा थैंक यू सवे साची प्रभु फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी टुडे फॉर दिस टॉक ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ sharing krishna's message with the western audience or with the contemporary audience now i would like to start by ha- by asking all of you a question uh, which will help me focus what i'm going to speak because it's a very big subject so when you try to share krishna consciousness with your friends with your family with your social circle what are the challenges that you confront what is it that you f- find makes them hesitate or hesitant or even apathetic or even sometimes hostile to do bhakti wisdom any thoughts from any of you Okay, let me. I can I can go ahead, Prabhu. Since uh, everyone seems to be quiet, so we'll just give them some time to put stuff on the chat box. I see. Um, Sevya Sachi Prabhu has said that um, he people normally say that it's a foreign culture. Um, uh, Tukuloho has said that it's uh, the different gods. um and i personally i i concur with savya satri prabhu in in a sense that whenever you speak about krishna consciousness um it's received in a light that you are trading cultures it seems to be a very indian thing uh for african bodied people so it's not it's not easily received okay um mataji so the- oh raised her hand i think she wants to say something you can mute your, you can unmute yourself mataji hari krishna um krishna. i agree with what nkosi nkosi is saying it's really people it's the anxiety that uh african people feel that they are uh losing their africanness and they are african culture and um you know also it comes from a trauma of christianity of christianity being imposed on africans um that history has traumatized the african psychology and emotionally that uh, africans are feeling that um they are being stripped constantly of their africanness oh so they so the fear is that are we going to be like another imperial culture that if we adopt krishna consciousness then again that's another way we might lose our africanness is that how means is that the same attitude same fear i'm just trying to connect the two what you said with uh, so the fear is that uh, first of all this is a culture different from our own so why should we follow it and in the past we have followed some other culture or some other culture some other tradition already imposed on us and that had that had unhealthy consequences to put it mildly so why why take something up now 
that's an important point <clears throat> now that would apply to to any tradition that might be trying to share say any tradition that is not african trying to spread itself sorry i can't hear it's too faint mm. this is that uh, i think if offering is available but one other thing prabhu is that there's um there's a christian influence around in africa so they may worry about your liberation if you're going to make it back to heaven they think that you're getting lost and you're going to go to hell okay so because christianity has that exclu- exclusive attitude that is the only way so if you explore some other faith then they may not go to they may not go to they may not be delivered because if that is the only way that's an important concern so anything specifically about krishna consciousness like one thing is the foreign culture in itself but there are the different gods when we say foreign culture what are we specifically referring to are we referring to the dress the food the mantras we chant or what exactly do we mean by foreign culture or when people feel concerned about a foreign culture uh, uh prabhu i see here that uh, bafana has said in the chat that they consider it as foreign um and people hate it um because they have an impersonal sense of of who and what god is okay so the impersonal would... conception also makes the idea of a personal divinity a little more difficult to accept okay that makes sense yeah. yes uh, i actually with bafana's point i would add that uh the idea of god and, and an image of god christianity has been strong here and it has not identified god in a form and so they think these must be man made its idolatry so they think uh hinduism or that is uh, getting you into idolatry okay so <clears throat> i am listing all these things and we will see how many we can address but f- f- mm. are there any other major concerns uh, uh tukuloho has said that uh, another concern is vegetarianism okay vegetarianism as a practice seems to be uh, to be too foreign to be too difficult is it just foreign or is it too difficult is it uh, means what is the concern about vegetarianism it's too difficult to follow or it's too intrusive in their life or what exactly uh, she says that it he or she says that it it's because it is so far into them i'm guessing this stems from the fact that um of recently in the recent history um africans have become um meat eaters um heavily so it it becomes a foreign concept to understand a diet that or to practice a diet that has no meat. Oh, okay. And Okay. So these are some excellent points which we'll try to address one by one. Now I will take uh, I had planned a whole presentation but since the kind of uh, points which we have got are a little more specific i will reorient it of course i'll take some of the points which i mentioned thank you for this uh, broad overview of the challenges which you are facing now now i i'll just start, so i'll be sharing a powerpoint which will be also i'll be using as a whiteboard that means in the powerpoint itself like a blackboard i'll type some things that are even required so let's begin so presenting krishna's message to a contemporary audience that's what we're going to speak of so i'll address four points the need to respect people where they are not just think that they are objects for preaching but first is we 
we'll look at Prabhupada's quotes and other things to appreciate this point. The need to respect people where they are. Then we'll talk about how at understanding how a tradition stays living. There is a living tradition and there is a, like a dead or a fossilized tradition. So how does the tradition stay living? That will be the second point I'll discuss. Then third will be the different modes of outreach. So our purpose is to out do outreach, to share Krishna's wisdom, but deciding which mode of outreach works the best. That will be third point. And then we will address some of the specific concerns if they don't get addressed beforehand. So before I go into these, you know, I'd like to start with how now I haven't visited Africa specifically. I've traveled almost all other continents, of course, not Antarctica. We don't have any outreach happening over there, but uh, most of the continents. So I grew up in, in, in India in a pious family, religious, you could say culturally religious, not spiritually religious. And then I got my education in a prominent uh, engineering college in India. That's when I was introduced to Krishna consciousness. And for the first 10 years of my, my maybe 10 to 15 years almost of my spiritual life, as a brahmachari, I was trained in one of the most, uh, we could say, rigid or conservative brahmachari ashrams, where I had very black and white ideas of what is Krishna consciousness and what is not Krishna consciousness. And I would say that gave me a very strong foundation. But then from... In the last 10 years, I have been traveling extensively. Uh, my spiritual master told me to, in 2008, I, I was always interested in writing. So my spiritual master, His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj, told me that you should learn to write for a westernized audience. Because if you learn to write that way, more and more of the world is becoming westernized. So maybe from around 2007, 2008, I started reading about uh, reading various spiritual authors and spiritual who are prominent in the world today. Not so much to learn their ideas, but to more learn and to understand how they present their ideas. And then from 2014, I have been traveling across the world. Before the pandemic started, I was almost nine months a year. I was outside India. So mostly in America and then Australia, Europe and other parts of the world. So over the years, my understanding of Krishna consciousness itself has, I would say, been radically revolutionized just by seeing how different devotee, different people from different parts of the world are making Krishna an integral part of their life while living in a way that would be very different from what I as a conservative brahmachari born in a Brahmin family in India, would think of as Krishna consciousness. And then as I was doing this, as I was observing people whom I would never have considered Krishna conscious, being very devoted, my attention also started going more and more within our tradition, within Prabhupada's books and within the previous Acharya's books, where I found that what I had thought of as Krishna consciousness uh, was actually just one version of Krishna consciousness. There are many, many different ways of being Krishna conscious. So I would like to start. So, so why am I talking about the need to respect people where they are? Because generally, at least the idea I grew up with is we have the truth and you just have to find the ways to give the truth to others, which is at one level true. But the underlying dynamic is that actually people are foolish and that's why they don't understand the truth. So we have to, our intelligence is to make foolish people understand. But over the years, I realized that that was not the approach that Prabhupada had. Prabhupada respected his audience. And yes, people may not be God conscious. They may have certain behaviors and certain habits, which we would consider heavily anti-spiritual. But still Prabhupada also has many quotes where he talks about respecting people where they are. So I'll start with one quote like that. This is a long quote from a letter which Shila Prabhupada wrote for the devotees who were planning to do outreach in universities. So, uh, so I'll go, I'll read out the whole quote and then I have some points explaining these quotes. 
so after each of these sections i mentioned i'll talk four sections the first is the need to respect people where they are after each of these sections uh, we can have some reflections some feedback if if you you like to share any thoughts or have any questions and that way we'll we'll try to cover the sections so shri prabhupada is saying over here now i want that we shall recruit more and more our men amongst the intelligent class of men the prabhupad lived at a time when men was considered gender inclusive and prabhupad refers to men it refers to men and women everyone <clears throat> so because they are a little educated or they have got some wealth or fame or ability so they will be sometimes little puffed up but that is all right they deserve it so this is amazing what is prabhupad saying even even if they are puffed up they deserve it now why do they deserve it he is not saying they are god conscious See, this is a very different approach from prabhupad saying that the krishna is the one and everything else is zero everything else is useless prabhupad is saying if they are educated or even if they have wealth or fame or ability they need to be respected for that they deserve it now we'll see what it means so now prabhupad is saying now we shall have to learn the art how to approach such higher class of men and attract them to apply themselves to this krishna consciousness process of self realization so prabhupada is not saying now go and teach those higher class of men prabhupada is saying we will have to learn the art so he is putting the onus on us so in one sense the topic which we are discussing is is an example of what shri prabhupada actually wanted us to do he is saying that we have to learn the art how to approach such higher class of men now higher class prabhupada is not referring here to anything like a, a brahman kshatriya vaishya shudra higher in that sense he is considering higher in the sense of today's world in today's world estimate somebody who has wealth or fame or ability or education so fame could also be in various ways nowadays people are influencers on the internet just because they have they provide some entertainment and they have lot of uh, followers so they may have fame so prabhupada says we need to learn the art how to approach them then he says that requires much tact now it's significant he uses the word tact so he is not saying that you know krishna consciousness is this just present it and uh, here he is saying require we, we tact and we shall have to we shall have to expect to meet all challenges by sharp minds by sharp mind so he is appreciating that these people they have sharp minds they are intelligent and they will ask questions so we should be we should be ready for that and not just give the answers but give the answers tactfully so then prabhupad of course comes back to the core principle but if you remain remain always absorbed in remembering lord chaitanya how he converted so many intelligent people even sitting for 3 days and nights to hear them speak without himself speaking anything so and if you remember how krishna was so much patient to explain everything to arjuna so here we see chaitanya mahaprabhu when he interacted with sarvabhoum bhattacharya especially you know he sat and heard from sarvabhoum bhattacharya for several days so this is about rather than simply thinking people are ignorant we understand what is the understanding people have and for that we need to hear from them and pro so pro also give the example of krishna and even arjuna uh, was speaking like a fool so even though arjuna if you see the first chapter krishna doesn't speak a single word and if you consider the bhagavad gita is 700 verses so 700 verses is not a huge body so out of that 46 verses is is almost 115th of the time krishna allows arjuna to speak and krishna allows arjuna to ask questions throughout and then last part is in this way being always tolerant of others and appreciating their points of view it will be easy matter for us to convince them gradually to join us so this i would say everything that uh, i am going to speak if you forget everything this is one key thing appreciating their points of view so we we may think you know this is this is wrong this is bad this is immoral this is anti scriptural whatever no but appreciating their points of view so people have particular understandings for particular reasons 
So rather than saying simply their viewpoint is wrong, we appreciate whatever is good in that viewpoint, or whatever is good in what has brought them to that viewpoint. So I'll explain this a little bit more. But the idea is, if we appreciate their points of view, and we are tolerant of others, then we can convince them gradually to join us. So, Prabhupada is actually putting the onus on us to learn this. So, this is a letter to Balwant, and this is December 30, 1972. And in one sense, Shri Prabhupada also in the his first year in America, he left India in 1965. And he started his call in 1966. In his first year, Prabhupada didn't have many speaking opportunities, formal talks. But Prabhupada was very carefully, he would go for long walks. He would, he would interact informally with people. And he was observing American culture, trying to understand how American people think, how they live. In fact, one of his hosts, uh, his first host actually, uh, was the Agarwal family. So Sally and Gopal Agarwal, they never became devotees in the conventional sense of the word. But what Sally Agarwal says about Prabhupada is that he was curious about everything. He wanted to, Prabhupada had never seen a vacuum cleaner in India for cleaning a house. So he wanted to know, know how the vacuum cleaner works. He wanted to know everything about how things work. And <clears throat> another thing she said that Prabhupada was the easiest guest I ever had. Now, generally, if we go to meet our relatives or friends, how many of them are going to say that we are the easiest guests they had? You now, we will have a long list of, you know, I, I won't eat this, I won't do this, I won't do this, I won't do this. And Prabhupada, he, he said that Prabhupada would just chant Hare Krishna and he would cook for himself. You know, I didn't have to do anything to entertain him. He says, apart from accommodating him, I didn't have to do any adjustment to, his, to my life to have him there. So appreciating their points of view. Let's elaborate on this a little bit. So, <clears throat> they deserve to be puffed up, Prabhupada says. So this brings this point that respect people for what they have achieved in their terms. In their terms. Why in their terms? Because we may say that, oh, all these are just mundane achievements and they are temporary, wealth is temporary, fame is temporary. Yes, it may be temporary in the ultimate sense. But still, achieving it requires talent, it requires hard work, and nothing comes free in the world. So if people have achieved education, people have achieved wealth, people have some talent and ability, respect them for what they have achieved uh, in their terms. In one sense, this is the way, this is also one way we are Krishna conscious. Because Krishna says, I am ability in people. So wherever some ability is manifested, so, you know, if we consider the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says in 7.8 that I am ability in people. So whoever has ability, now they may not be using that ability in Krishna's service, but they have that ability and that ability is a manifestation of Krishna. Or for that matter, if they have anything extraordinary, so Krishna says, I am the spark. So, or other, all opulences are a spark of my splendor. Yadyad vibhuti mat sattvam shrima durjita mevava. Tatta deva avaga chattvam mamate eju amshi sambhava. So, actually, if we say, oh, these are just materialistic people, they have, no, they have no spiritual knowledge, they have no spiritual values, they have such terrible habits. No, they have achieved some things, and they're, if they are manifesting some ability, even if somebody is, say, singing sensual songs, or is doing whatever they are doing, but the, the but they're doing something well. That's why people are attracted to them. And to do that well, they need some ability. And that ability is a manifestation of Krishna. So that's how we need to appreciate people. So they deserve to buffer up Prabhupada says. Learn, now the second point is learn the art of how to approach such higher class of men. So what this means is, we may be right. I mean, I, I study the Bhagavad Gita, I study the Bhagavad Gita, I know what is the right thing to do. But just because we know what is right, doesn't mean we know the right way to present it. Why is that? Because in some ways, 
everybody has their own language see generally if we consider this way language is not just means for communicating language also here it can metaphorically it refers to mode of thinking so imagine right now if i spoke this class in say sanskrit or in hindi or in marathi now uh, in some of the indian languages now no matter how logical and reasonable the class might be it would make no sense to you because the language is different so now language refers to the means for communication but meta metaphorically we can say that different people have different modes of thinking and we could so just uh, so we need to understand how people think and then we can present it to them and that's why it's important to talk with people not talk to them and certainly not talk at them talk at them means you know we treat them simply as objects to be transformed by our speech directed at them they are conscious people and nobody likes to be talked down to like i sit on a high pedestal and i give give discourses to people in today's world at least many people don't like that so talk with people means that we understand where they are coming from we understand our audience so one of the things i learned from my uh, travels abroad and i'm still learning it is that i may give a class for 45 minutes but before the class when i talk with the organizers uh, i understand a lot more and if i don't have a talk some little talk with the organizers i find that my my whatever content i am pre presenting it's not that effective especially if it's not a regular audience that means if i'm speaking to devotees then it's quite uh, straight forward but of course every place every every temple every center has its own mood and its concerns also but in general if you are speaking to a new, a new audience it's important to understand where they are coming from so talk with people and also after the class on zoom it's not so easily possible online but generally after the class we spend time with people and we hear them we hear them and that's how we learn so how do we learn this art now after a class we ask the audience you know what point spoke to you or what point did you find difficult to accept and when they speak and we we let them speak not that we see that as a threat or as a challenge but we let them speak then we will understand okay this this point clicks this point doesn't click this point evokes resistance and that's how we can actually learn this art out of how to approach this higher class of men and then the last point i'll mention appreciating their points of view so don't judge just judge their viewpoint from our perspective as devotees it's very easy for us to label this person is a impersonal list this person is a demigod worshipper this person is this this person is that so understand why they think the way they do sometimes we just judge or evaluate their thoughts but more important than that is understanding their thinking it's very easy to fix a label or oh, this person is like this but okay they may be like this but why are they like that what part of that particular some i may say somebody is an atheist do i have found sometimes actually it is easier to have a rational discussion with a atheist than like a blind follower of some religious tradition hmm? in fact i would say that if somebody has is a unthinking even an unthinking practitioner of bhakti they may have a particular conception this is how things are done and it's very difficult to have a reasonable discussion with them but rather somebody might be an atheist but they have done some intellectual homework they have thought they may have come to a wrong conclusion a conclusion that there's no ultimate reality but rather than simply labeling that con conception oh atheism is demoniac well rather than okay what uh, what uh, what about atheism do you like and more often than not it is not so much anybody people like atheism it is they dislike religion as they have experienced it so uh, so if you understand their thinking 
that's what appreciating their points of view means it doesn't mean we have to agree with them there are things which are, which there are absolute truths you know if, if we if the bhagavad gita teaches we are not the body we are the soul and somebody says no actually there is no such thing as a soul we don't have to agree with that thought but okay why does a person think like that appreciate their points of view so understand their thinking and that can help us connect with them in a way that they don't feel that we are talking down to them they we, we start we have to earn people's trust not we cannot presume that they are going to trust us and the way we earn their trust is by engaging with them where they are right now so this was the first point i was going to i was going to make about respecting people where they are at hmm. so one more point i'll mention before we uh, <clears throat> before we move ahead and if you have any reflections at this point please feel free to share them or any questions also i'll be happy to address but the key point i was going to make now is that quite often we think of things in black and white terms that okay this person is doing this and this person is not doing this person is doing x y z and is the person not doing so and so things but rather than simply thinking in terms of what they are doing or what they are not doing we see a more god conscious vision so god conscious vision of people means sometimes we see that okay this person is say not chanting chanting not chanting any god name is this person is eating meat this person is doing this uh, this person is not doing this but rather than seeing it that way we focus uh, the god conscious vision means see god in others lives not just in what they are doing or not doing in relationship with god that's one way we often look at okay so does this person eat meat does this person do this does this is this person having unrestrained sexual activity but rather than that we also need to focus on what god is doing in their lives right now so what god is doing is what god is doing in their lives means that just because somebody has not is not practicing bhakti or not practicing certain principles doesn't mean that there is no super soul in their heart god is still there in their heart and god is still acting in their lives so even if they are following a particular tradition even if they are atheists just because they reject god doesn't mean god has rejected them krishna is there in everyone's hearts and if we try to understand people carefully then we will be able to see how actually krishna is acting in their lives even now and if we start seeing okay this is how krishna is acting in their lives then we can say okay i can take this forward from here so this is not just a strategic thing you know just because we want to convert people so we need to understand their way of thinking it's not just strategic it's actually deeply spiritual we understand that it's not that krishna starts acting in people's lives it is not that we begin krishna's action in people's lives when we give them a book or when we tell them to chant hari krishna even before them for many many lifetimes krishna has been accompanying them in their hearts and krishna has been acting so whatever understanding they have maybe 90% of it is off from the perspective of the bhagavad gita but 10% is on and that is krishna's that is krishna's plan in their lives so what god is doing in their lives if you start looking at it in that terms now how has how god has shaped this person so that they have some aspect of receptivity toward krishna if we have that vision then we will actually be able to authentically respect people where they are at not just tactical not just you know like tactically respect them because we want to convert them actually we don't want we are not converting them we are simply continuing and accelerating the plan that krishna has for them by connecting them with resources that can take them forward this is a much more inclusive vision of krishna bhakti so any reflections or questions at this point um hari krishna prabhu um there was yeah. a reflection or a comment in the chat chat box from uh, saradia rasati vitasi um <clears throat> i think they've said that hari krishna dear devotees thank you for organizing this class 
um, it's very informative. That's thank you for that comment. Yeah, I noticed that, Sadhir. Can you tell me what you found informative about this? Was it the Prabhupada code or the analysis or what? What exactly do you find informative? Um, Sarad, you can unmute yourself if you please, or you can type it in the chat box. Your response to Prabhu. Oh, oh she she cannot um, unmute. I'm I'm hoping that perhaps then she may contribute on the the chat, and then I'll read it to Prabhu as as the lecture continues. Hare Krishna Prabhu, so, so the, the host just needed to enable me to unmute, so now I'm, oh, I'm unmuted. <laughs> no, it, it's <laughs> fine. So uh, Prabhu, thank you very much for the class. I really find it very informative and also very inspiring. And I, I think I just, I appreciate it because for me, sometimes I felt in ISKCON that devotees create too much of this distinction between like us as devotees and then like, you know, the kind of degraded karmis. And I think if that is your approach, it is actually not very spiritual. And, mm. you know, people pick that up, that, that you actually feel that you're superior and you feel that you've got to save them. So I really appreciated how you've unpacked how, you know, that is actually not the mood to approach people. And that's actually true. You know, thank you for saying that. Uh, it is, if people feel that uh, we are speaking down to them, it certainly alienates them. If So nobody really thinks that everybody needs help. And in one sense, people are open to help. But before they are open to receiving any help, they want to see how we see them. In one sense, self-help books are big in today's world. People flock for motivational talks. People do, people do like that many things. But while doing those things, they, they, want, to, they want to see what is it? Uh, how are you going to treat me? So yes, if we somehow come off as a, with a holier than thou attitude, then uh, it's a lot of problems. I'm sorry, Prabhu. I'll just add, but I also appreciate that some devotees always say that Prabhupada said we should speak very direct and you know we should tell people that you know what their mistakes are etc but the quote that you shared showed that Prabhupada was sensitive to the audience and wanted us to adjust to the audience yeah yeah now it is thank you yes it is true that Prabhupada did talk about being direct uh, but that was largely if you see the confrontational direct talks of Prabhupada, this is right, this is wrong, that comes more in the zone of Prabhupada speaking to his close disciples during his morning walks, now, during his talks to new people, and especially if you consider the, the conversations which Prabhupada had with thought leaders, it was quite different. And he was very, he, he would listen to them, he would have talk, discussions with them. So in that sense, that, you know, again, like there is no uh, one way of being Krishna conscious. There are many different ways of being Krishna conscious. So similarly, there are many different aspects to Prabhupada. And this quote, it actually, it was almost after 18 years of reading Shila Prabhupada's book several times that I came across this quote. And I have read Prabhupada's letters, Prabhupada's books, Prabhupada's conversations. This is, I would say, such an important uh, quote. But it is lost in many other things that Prabhupada has spoken or many other things that are highlighted from what Prabhupada has spoken. That's true. Thank you. Yes, so from Bhapna's iPad, this is dynamic and uh, revolutionary. Thank you. Happy to be of service. So I presume when you say revolutionary, it refers to this approach of Prabhupada talking about appreciating others' points of view. Is that what you are referring to as revolutionary? You can type if you like. And I think a couple of, yes, can be treated as, as equal, soul brothers and sisters, not some weaklings. Yes, that's true. You know, everybody needs help and we also need help. So when we are offering help, it is not from a holier than thou attitude. 
and i was in texas in america i was going now in america texas is a part of a bible belt where there's quite evang- aggressive evangelical christianity so i saw a car bumper it had a sticker on it, it says oh god please save me from your preachers oh god please save me from your preachers so <laughs> now the idea is god saves us through his preachers but these preachers have such an attitude that save me from them i don't want to have, have anything to do with them so that's save me from your preachers so we don't want to have ever that have that attitude yes thank you for clarifying that revolutionary means we see others empathically yes sir. um i think there are a couple of other hands would you like to uh decide who wants to speak i think uh oaheng mataji's hand went up first so she can start thank you prabhu this has been so insightful uh, i especially resonated or what resonated with me was recognizing krishna's work in in other people's life and understanding that krishna is always at work even if like you said it's a 1% uh, visible uh, visible uh, activity but to quite ca- kind of connect with people find out how god is working in 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 their lives and take it from there um and um yeah this is the most the most important to to really really always remember in whatever situation however bad people are whether they are heavy into drugs or whatever there is uh, 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 god is still working with them and in them yeah and uh, we, we have to take that it's it's uh, you know for me this has been one of the most transformative understandings as when i became a brahmachari i left my family and i didn't connect with them at all for over a decade and after that as i matured i started connecting with them and i started seeing that they had so many changes in their lives and you know i can see krishna i can't i mean i won't claim that i have any supernatural visions but i can see how they are evolving how their vision is changing how the, the things are broadening their perspectives are broadening so even if they are not conforming to krishna consciousness as it is normally taught but actually their consciousness is expanding and we see that as krishna acting in their lives so even if somebody is addicted to something but if that addiction is making them feel the need for something higher in their lives and then they are, that is making them more receptive then that is also a step ahead that is also a pathway to growth so yes thank you for sharing that yes sinazo yes yeah hari krishna prabhu um i have a question yeah sure so my personal my personal interest in terms of preaching is preaching to people who are um who are kind of spiritual in a sense or who are religious but not necessarily connected to krishna con- who are mm, i don't know how to put this people who are who are maybe colloquially spiritual but not actually connected to Chris- to krishna in the sense of having a personal relationship to god so people who might be practicing in a religion but who are sort of outwardly just sort of going through the motions of a practice but are engaging in a personal sense so yeah. in that way what, my question is how do you begin to um is it necessary for those people to convert specifically to krishna consciousness in order to be more practice in order to be more connected to krishna because i feel like i grew up in a christian household where my mom is a staunch christian she is being a practicing active kind of regulated christian and who follows a lot of the principles of krishna consciousness but calls herself a christian a christian and isn't 
wouldn't ever sort of associate with Krishna. So I'm thinking for people like that, would it still be necessary for them to convert to Krishna consciousness? Or can it be sort of more an interfaith kind of dialogue where we're sharing perspectives and realizations about Godhead from different spiritual traditions? I hope I'm making sense. Yeah, I, I think this was a topic which I was going to discuss toward the end because that was something which is great, but let's discuss it now. Mm. Broadly, there can be we could say three approaches to spirituality. Mm -hmm. So I think you can see this. See the bottom of a mountain, this is material consciousness. The top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, ultimate, so the we can say top of the consciousness is love for God. And so now exclusivism oh. is the idea that there is only one path up the mountain, my way or the highway. And they are, the purpose is to go to the mountain, but those who are exclusivists, they are attached more to the path than, than the purpose. And so this is one way spirituality is conceived. Many of the traditions, the Abrahamic traditions especially, they perceive spirituality in this way that it is exclusivist. Now, if you conceive a pendulum, one extreme of the pendulum is exclusivism. The other extreme of the pendulum is pluralism. Now, pluralism is all paths are right. Whatever you want to follow, that's fine. But if I'm at the bottom of a mountain, all paths don't take me up the mountain. Now, some may take me half the way up, uh, one third of the way up the mountain, bring me down. Some may take me half the way up. Some may take me just here. Some may just take me round and round the mountain. Some may take me actually down into a valley away from the mountain. So pluralism says, yes, everybody has a right to believe what they want. Everybody has a right to practice what they want. That's true. But just because they have a right to believe what they want and practice what they want, doesn't mean that what they believe and what they practice is right. There's a difference between having a right and being right. They're two different things. So pluralism is not very spiritual, necessarily spiritual. It might be a political necessity in today's world where mostly we, have, we are secular. But spiritually, that is not what is going to be very conducive. So beyond that, there is what we can call as inclusivism. Inclusivism is we understand there are many paths to the same purpose. You know, if I want to go back, go up the mountain, there could be different paths up the mountain. It doesn't have to be only one path up the mountain. And broadly, this was Prabhupada's approach. When Prabhupada talked about say, Jesus Christ, he said, he's our guru. He, he had so much love for God that he was ready to give up his own life for the sake of God. So in that sense, Prabhupada was very appreciative. Having said that, so once we understand this principle that uh, Krishna consciousness is actually not exclusivist. It is not that we say Krishna is the only way. That would be a misrepresentation of Krishna consciousness. But we are not also pluralistic. It is we are more inclusivist that there can be many paths to one purpose. The purpose is raising human consciousness. Ultimately to the level of bringing them to God consciousness, love of God. So there can be different paths. Now, Prabhupada's approach when dealing with say, people from different faiths was at one level twofold. If somebody was for any reason committed to a particular path, then he would not generally challenge or shake their commitment. So for example, if somebody was a, was a priest or a pastor or some kind of office bearer in a particular religious tradition, and then they came to meet him, Prabhupada would talk with them and try to make them more conscious. So for example, with Christians, he would talk about meat eating and he would encourage them to move toward a meat free diet. So like that, whatever they are doing, they, if somebody is already committed to a particular path, now they may not actually be spiritual. They might just be culturally committed. 
they might be ethnically committed whatever it is but if they are committed that way then encourage them to explore their path deeper in a way that actually helps them rise in krishna consciousness so in one sense actually if we study the philosophy of krishna consciousness in a broad way it's not just about showing us a path up the mountain it also helps us get a understanding of the whole mountain and then we can say okay in this tradition these practices these practices are acceptable all and they can actually elevate people and we encourage them to take those practices so that's how the audience can, that's how people can move up in their paths so if somebody is nominally connected and not very seriously connected then encourage them to explore krishna consciousness and they may take up krishna consciousness also they may take up chanting they may start studying the bhagavad gita and whether they take up krishna consciousness in the external sense of becoming devotees or they just become more god conscious in their practices and their tradition that is something i think we sh- we can't force it ultimately faith can't be mandated or legislated faith has to be individually awakened in the heart so so, so our purpose is to actually elevate people's faith not not confuse them so if somebody is very strongly committed to say christianity and then or say in the indian context if say you now i cannot go into details but say in in, my, in india we have people worshiping different devta different different gods now if somebody is they worshiping ganesh or shiva or somebody like that or durga or somebody is having a particular faith conception you know this is not right this is right and if you get into an aggressive debate with them and the end result is they start thinking that you know every every group of people every religious group thinks that they are the best or they are the only way and this is also confusing so i don't want to be involved in this religious business because it's so confusing and i give it all up and become materialistic and atheistic well that has not helped them in any way so if somebody is committed to a particular path now some people when they are missionaries what their idea of mission is they just keep going round and round at the bottom of the mountain and pulling everyone down from the path by which they are going up that is not what we want them to do if they are just at the bottom of the mountain and exploring upwards now we can say you know there are distinctive advantages of krishna conscious path we have the holy name which is a eminently potent uh, potent um, potent resource for going up we have a very clear philosophy in the bhagavad gita and the vedic tradition so there are distinctive aspects of our path which can be presented so just because we are saying that there are different paths up, up the mountain doesn't mean all paths are equally easy some paths might be more rocky some paths might be more slippery some paths might be thickly forested so like that we can do a comparative theology where we present we don't have to say that this this is wrong and this is right but rather we can say what are the positives of krishna consciousness which make it easier one of the strongest positives is that we have a much clearer conception of god as compared to any other tradition in the world so there are advantages that can be presented like that but that would be my broad answer i hope that addresses the question are there any other questions uh, at this stage um no prabhu we just <clears throat> have uh, comments um, more than questions i i don't know if perhaps you'd want me to read them out uh, to you okay i'm just look i'm looking at them right now all right um okay bafana was just saying that the challenge still remains to be that the name krishna is hard to communicate uh, to people and that christ um is the order and the author of their lives and transferring um is still not easily acceptable uh because people are visioned into going to heaven and their way um is christ if not that a traditional person then considers their way as ancestrally bound mm that's that's a significant concern and you know i think to address that i i will just make make some points but then i think 
the next part of it will also address it somewhat so generally when a person is committed you know what is committed to a particular path what exactly are they committed to within that path understanding that is also very important because when people practice spirituality you know suppose like some we might say this person is a impersonalist or this person is this that person is that but it's rarely that simple you know for most people for example the philosophy doesn't make that bigger difference they may be in a particular path because of because it is like the social situation in that path they like the the kind of people they meet the kind of people they interact with over there and that's what attracts them so it's important for us to find what is it that is their center that is their shelter and address that rather than thinking that there is any one standard thing so rather than labeling people for their religion or their practices we focus more on understanding what is it that is sheltering them and uh, what is inspiring them to connect with a particular tradition if you understand that part then we can address their concerns better so <clears throat> maybe i'll come to that in a few minutes toward the next part of the session but let's try to understand at this point when we talk about a tradition what do we actually mean mm -hmm. so when you talk about a living tradition there are multiple points in it so generally we think of say if i if we are following if we are say to be faithful to shila prabhupad faithful to krishna consciousness what does it mean we think okay whatever prabhupad has taught whatever is taught in the bhagavad gita we have to share that that is true but there is something deeper in it if we consider this outreach according to time place circumstances which prabhupad often talks about desha kala patra so this is the vertical line up is the tradition and so this the tradition means in the past for thousands of years people have been practicing something and then there is this circle that is there in the middle that is the living tradition the how it is presented today and then below is the contemporary culture the which are so in india there is a contemporary culture not a lot all of india's contemporary culture is spiritual uh, so there is a contemporary cultures in each part of the world so the living tradition is connected to the past by fidelity by faithfulness and the living tradition is connected with the present by its flexibility by its resourcefulness by its resourcefulness by flexibility so for example right now if we, if we went back in time 50 or 100 years ago or even maybe 20 years ago the kind of class we are having would have been impossible because there was no technology available for that so actually to have a class means we had to go physically to a place or at least we can have a radio or whatever 100 years ago probably none of that was possible but we are having a meaningful discussion because we are flexible okay even if we can't all be together at the same place still we can connect so this is so to connect with the contemporary audience there is a certain amount of flexibility that is required the flexibility can be with respect to language we speak in the language that people are uh, people are speaking it can be with respect to technology we adapt the technology which is which is important but what we often don't understand see with respect to language and technology it's it's common sense but beyond that there are things like psychology there are things like ideology so to understand people psychology and how can i connect with their psychology right now okay now most people may not say that i have an ideology or i have a philosophy but they all they have certain way of thinking so how can we connect with their philosophy their ideology right now so that intellectual level of adjustment is required and if you look back in our tradition now in every tradition there are something called as conservatives and there are liberals and often there is a conflict between the two of them so if the, the conservatives are more concerned about staying connected with the past and this was how it was done and this is how it should be done and that's required so going back to the previous diagram the conservatives are connect concerned more with fidelity 
and the liberals are connect concerned more with flexibility that this is we need to connect with people and we need to adjust so both are required for the tradition to be living we need to be connected with the past which is what conservatives focus on and we need to be connected with the present which is what liberals focus on so if if there is too much being conservative then what happens is there is fidelity fidelity is faithfulness without flexibility then the tradition becomes like a museum exhibit oh in the past these people used to believe this and practice this but there is nobody doing this right now so it becomes simply like a for something which in the past which is available only in a museum today but if, so so if if only the conservatives hold sway then so soon the culture will become soon the tradition will become not a living tradition but a dead tradition mm. on the other hand if only the uh, liberals hold sway there is flexibility without fidelity then what will happen is eventually we'll just become a part of the contemporary landscape we will just become another cultural fad a fashion trend that you know when it when what happens is fashion by fashion trend what i mean is that people are more spiritual shoppers than spiritual seekers shoppers means when i go shopping i like this from here like that from there like that from there now actually spirituality is not just about shopping it's about transforming it's about seeking so if there's we are flexible about everything then that will not work so what to the balance is there has to be a realistic hard blend between fidelity and flexibility if both are there then the tradition is a living tradition now the next part i will not go deeper into it because that will make us uh, have to study the tradition deeply but i'll just give some examples uh quickly that if you consider what our previous acharyas have done this dynamic we see in their lives bhaktivinod thakur he was the first person in our tradition to write books so write books which are in the format of a novel so the nowadays novels are one of the most widely selling books there are fiction and there's non fiction but 200 years ago there was no such thing as a novel there was playwrights and plays were written but the idea of a novel has come out recently and in our tradition bhaktivinoda thakur was the first person who wrote a novel he wrote prema pradeep he wrote even <clears throat> some of his other books jaiva dharma in the format of a novel so that was what was in vogue in bengal in the in the early 19th century uh, the late yeah in the in the 1900s early 1900 1890 so he did that so he connected with his contemporary people by doing what was required he took the message of the bhakti text but presented it accordingly now if you consider bhakti sanskar thakur he did some he had something called as the theistic exhibitions now theistic exhibitions were he would hire a huge ground one of the biggest grounds in kolkata and there he would have ha- half of the ground would be dioramas of lord chaitanya and his past times and his teachings and the remaining half was about science and technology and the latest developments in science and technology and there would be scientists and researchers they would come and uh, uh, present their things and he would give them a forum to present those things now we may say what is the what is krishna conscious about it well there is nothing directly krishna conscious but what happened is people came to see primarily that part but when they came to see that part they came and say saw the other part also okay this exhibition has all these things what else do they have oh they have these dioramas so the so bhaktan sutta could did that the theistic exhibitions was one of his main outreach projects and in those projects he was he connected now in, in no previous acharya had spent uh, energy doing festivals and events where in one sense nothing mundane is being presented now, uh, in something mundane is being presented but he presented the mundane and the spiritual so vidyam cha vidyam cha yastad vedo bhayam sah he was enacting the ishopanishad statement that we need knowledge about the material world and we need knowledge about the spiritual world to grow now prabhupada of course did many things to connect with the contemporary culture one of the things he did was the bhaktivedanta institute that was specifically meant for scholarly and scientific outreach that and that no previous acharya had actually dedicated a whole segment of the tradition for scientific outreach because science did not have that much currency and influence 
uh, 200, 300 years ago as it had as now. Now, of course, we could go and list of the many ways in which Prabhupada himself was flexible. But this is an important point to understand that when we are connecting with people, there is fidelity to some extent, but there is also flexibility. And unless both of them are together, we will not be effective in our outreach. So understanding when to do what is important. If we, we have a black and white conception of Krishna consciousness, then what happens is this is right, that is wrong, and nothing moves ahead from there. Then we don't really grow, and we don't help people to grow. Because we may em emphasize certain things which we may, certain, we may hold certain things as non-negotiable but they may those may actually not be essential for everyone so if now that brings me to the cultural part cultural part means now to become Krishna conscious how important is it for people to wear a particular dress a particular uh, a part, adopt a particular diet, adopt a per, certain particulars which they see as culturally alien, well, that is something which can vary. It is not a black and white thing because you know, even in India, for example, Manipur is a, Manipur is a state which became Gaudiya Vaishnava during, from the time of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his successes itself. And Manipur devotees had Manipur is in the northeast of India. And so what happened? Okay, let me. Am I sharing the screen? I don't think I am right now, isn't it? Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I come over here. Mm. Sorry. So when, when they were in Manipur, the devotees there had their own way of dressing, which is not exactly the dhoti kurta, which was the dress of Bengal. Mm. And they didn't have to change the dress to become Gaudiya Vaishnavas, to become followers of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They just adapted, they just adapted the core principles of Krishna consciousness. So So is dress non-negotiable? Is it essential part of the culture? Well, not if you look back at the culture itself. So Manipuris had their own dress. Now it is one of the I ironies. So Manipuri, Gaudi, now we, we belong to a tradition technically which is called as Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. This is part of the, one of the prominent expressions of Bhakti. So Manipuri Gaudiya Vaishnavas had retained their own dress. They retained their own dress while <clears throat> adopting bhakti. Now what happened was, now when ISKCON devotees went to Manipur and they started preaching in Manipur, the many of these devotees were <coughs> people who had practiced bhakti for 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever. And they were interacting with people who had been born in devotional families. Uh, they might not be chanting the same number of rounds exactly. But they were quite dedicated in their own way, quite devoted. And the devotees told <coughs> these Gaudiya Vaishnavas that if you don't wear dhoti kurta, if you don't eat this kind of food, if you don't do this, you are not a devotee. Now, that infuriated them. And later on, when more mature leaders went in that area and then they adapted. So that's when things worked out very well. <coughs> And in India also, uh, there is a lot of aggressive Christian conversion that is happening. So now the when the devotees went uh, in the tribal parts of India, interior parts of India, where still there's not much progress. So Christian conversion is happening very aggressively. And devotees went there with the savior complex. You know, we will save people. But when they tried to get people, the tribals to start adopting all the cultural aspects of Krishna consciousness, some of the local activists from those, those tribes and cultures, they said, we see no difference between Christianity and Krishna consciousness. 
because when we give, when we become christian we lose our culture and even when we become krishna conscious we lose our culture because india is a very broad country very big country so tribal outreach in india uh, now it has adopted a much more sensitive approach where we say okay you know <coughs> you can speak your own language retain your own dress and cook you and eat your own food but of course no food means not meat if you want to become initiated there are certain regulations to be followed try uh, respect broad aspects of tribal culture so that's when actually tribal tribal outreach started happening significantly so like this there are there it is up to the responsible thoughtful leaders of a movement in a particular area to understand you know what we can be flexible about and what we need to be faithful about what we can't change and what we can change what can be adjusted what can't be adjusted so of course there are core principles that can't be changed and what can't be changed what can uh, what can can be adjusted that is a matter of discussion the careful deliberation prayer experience that is a big subject in itself but the principle is that we krishna conscious is not something is non negotiable do this or you are out of here it, there are many aspects of krishna consciousness which are adjustable and that adjustment this is a i'll conclude this point with this that uh, seeing adjustment positively so adjustment is not compromise it is compassion it is not compromise as you know think of compromising you know oh you are doing this because you are pandering to people no it is compassion people are coming from a particular background people have particular ways of living people have particular ways of thinking and functioning do we really is it reasonable to expect them to give up everything that has grounded them in their lives till now and reject it all for the for the sake of practicing krishna bhakti well is is krishna making such stiff demands from people no krishna gives if you read the bhagavad gita krishna offers multiple levels of connecting with him in gita 12.8 to 11 krishna offers multiple way multiple levels at which you can connect with him he says you try to do this if you can't do this then you do this and if you can't do this you do this so krishna himself is offering a multi level approach and in vc krishna's mood in the bhagavad gita is that so krishna in the gita especially when he says 4.11 in the gita what does he say 4.11 is basically all people are on my path all people are on my path when i said that earlier that try to understand how god is acting in people's life that is based on this all people are on my path what this means is krishna's mood we could put it this way that from your place at your pace access my grace so what krishna is saying over here is from your place from your place at your pace access my grace this was prabhupad's mood actually when he said he didn't even introduce the regulatory principles initially so just start, come to the kirtans chant dance sing take the prasad and access krishna at that level if you do that you will grow by that so this is actually the mood of compassion so when we have that compassionate mood then we can adjust things while knowing what is non adjustable and we can help people grow in for, go forward from where they are at so any reflections or questions on this point okay there's some good comments from sardia rasmata that how the usa house often incorporate traditional african garments in their attire they are devotees but still grounded in their cultural roots and it's probably more attractive and inspiring to local people yes i would say uh, his holiness bhakti tirth maharaj was also a pioneer in this when i had gone to america i was i visited one of the ipas centers and they have a whole wardrobe of 
wardrobe of the various dresses that maharaj would wear while connecting with people from different backgrounds so yes that's it's 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 a it's an example of resourcefulness and that's also a part of our tradition thank you so any other any reflections or questions at this point i would like to ask um prabhu yes that uh you know you made very beautiful point and showed that slide of uh, flexibility and fidelity and uh how do we get that idea across more systemically in a yatra where there is maybe a tendency to lean more to the cultural expression which is uh hinduism and uh not much space to allow other cultural expressions to come into bhakti yeah how how can we if somebody has uh, somebody has particular emphasis see, in one sense i find that we as a movement are facing a significant challenge which we need to negotiate very carefully i'll start this with a metaphor at one time i had severe digestive problems and uh, i also had severe iron deficiency and the medicine that i got for iron deficiency accentuated worsen my digestive problems so the cure for one disease or one dysfunction was the cause of another disease so it was a catch 22 situation it was a, almost like a irresolvable situation and then the way i decided to deal with it was to do a piecemeal approach and i decided i'll not worry about my iron i'll work on my uh, digestive system for 3 6 months focus only on treating that once i got that in order then i decided to focus on my iron iron deficiency issues so and once my digestive system had recovered then it could cope with iron medicine also so why am i re- referring to this example is that our movement in one sense uh, is serving different uh, purposes for different audiences so what i mean by different purposes for different audiences is that for many indians it is a cultural home it is a cultural home away from india and in that sense it is serving a very very important purpose and uh, to the extent it is serving that purpose as a cultural home they want to and they need to keep the cultural elements intact without that they won't feel that this is a cultural home at all and so for example indians uh, when they are outside india they have a lot of concern about how to ensure that their children continue to at least have some semblance of the values that they had in their own childhood so <clears throat> or in their own family and if that is what is bringing people to krishna then uh, that is what is bringing them to krishna then they will want to see the cultural aspect okay this is a place where this is in, in one sense they are not just seeking krishna they are seeking india over there and india is of course we know much bigger than krishna so so then what happens is <clears throat> if that particular if say certain rituals are not practiced in a way in which <coughs> they were done in their homes then people feel that i'm not really interested in this this is not serving my needs so what can i do at this point well i have to i have to make sure that those needs are served and i'll find out whatever way they can be served 
So here, I'll show you a diagram. Let's see if it comes through. See, our spiritual center ultimately is Krishna. We all are trying to approach Krishna. But different people come to Krishna through different sources. So somebody might come through cultural, sorry, say the intellectual. That means they have existential questions about life. That, you know, what is life meant for? Who am I really? What happens to me after death? Now, for such people, the Gita's wisdom and philosophy and the broad philosophy of the Vedic tradition is very valuable. So when such people come to a temple or come to a center, the primary thing that interests them is the, is the talk. You know, if the talk is very predictable, the talk is very typical and stereotyped, and they, feel, they, they don't feel inspired to come. Because their primary connection with Krishna, so in one sense, I'm showing the arrow going outside means for them, Krishna is manifesting primarily through the intellectual aspect. Hmm? Krishna is attracting them through the intellectual presentation of Bhakti. For some people, it might be emotional. That means you just come to a spiritual place and you feel very good. I just feel some vibes over here. I feel peaceful over here. I, or there is some meditation going on. And sometimes it can be musical meditation, sometimes it can be more softer meditation. It just makes me feel so peaceful. Now, so when they come to a place which is very peaceful and uh, uh, pacifying, then they, that's, that's, that's what is attracting them toward Krishna. For some people, it might be relational. Relational means uh, they feel that yeah, these, these devotees are good people. These are like kind of people I want to hang out with. Uh, they're they're pleasant. They're kind. Uh, they're they're trustworthy. They're following living a life of principles. I want to be with these people. This is so so it is. They want a bigger sense of belonging. This is one of the main reasons why people want to be spiritual. Is they want to belong to some community. Our modern lives are becoming very fragmented. The families are fragmenting. The communities are fragmenting. So they come here primarily for relational purposes. Now, all of these are not black and white because relational and emotional can also be connected. But there is a certain difference between the two. It's a matter of emphasis. And cultural means that some people come because they like the cultural aspect of it. Oh, you know, I can see the Lord being worshipped, the Aarti being performed. I can see this being, uh, this is how it, I saw this in my childhood. This is how it was done. And now far away from India or wherever I am, I can see the same things being done. So now, whatever it is that has attracted us to Krishna consciousness, that is what we want the most. So if somebody has, for example, come from for a relational perspective, they just want people with whom they can connect with, then if they find some devotees behaving in a judgmental way, in an in a angry way, in an impolite or rude way, that shakes their foundation. So that shakes them. How can you behave like this? Now we may say, yeah, you know, devotees also have conditionings. Don't take it so seriously. Neglect those devotees. But if for them, that is the foundation. So the Krishna is not directly their center right now. Their center right now is relationships. And when that is shaken, they just can't bear it. So for similarly, somebody who has come from a cultural perspective, for them, that is the foundation. And they see something is not done the way it was done in the past. And they say, yeah, I can't accept this. How can you do like this? That shakes them too much. So what we need is that. So I give the example of this disease. The point I was making through that is that many Indians come because of the cultural aspect. And that's what they need. They need, okay, these are the kind of rituals we practice. Now, the word rituals has a negative connotation. But, you know, this is what we did in India. And this is what we want to want as a cultural home. Now, now that is a valuable need. And uh, through that also, they are, they are becoming serious about Krishna consciousness. But many non-Indians who come to the, our temple centers... They, for them, the cultural is not the attractor. The cultural is the primarily the thing that causes hesitation. That is what causes apprehension. So that's why 
the the cause of the the cure for one disease is the cause of the other disease so what attracts indians is what repels non indians so now how central is the cultural for the spiritual for krishna now many indians may find that if some some devotees come uh, to a temple in a attire that is not traditional that is maybe inappropriate revealing how can you come to a temple like that within an indian context that would be un unconscionable that would be unacceptable it's just not done but if somebody is coming to a spiritual place uh, they are coming there primarily because they just want to feel peaceful they are so disturbed in their minds they just want to we have to go to a place where i can be peaceful so they are coming from the emotional perspective now they may not even be aware of what kind of dress i am wearing i just want get my life is a mess and i want some relief i want to go here and be peaceful and on there at that time tell why why are you wearing this kind of dress don't wear this wear this they say you know i am already agitated you are giving me one more cause for agitation why should i come here so for them it comes off as very judgmental many things like that there could be small dress could be just for example many things like that can come off as judgmental so i don't know what is the solution to this at least i feel initially it just separate that means outreach to indians and outreach to non indians can be done through separate avenues eventually there can be integration where once the devotees are little more mature by hmm, the, the indians also they start moving from the cultural to the spiritual to krishna and they start saying that okay the cultural is not the only way to krishna somebody might pay take the intellectual way to krishna and then they may adopt the culture after a long time or they may not adopt it much at all but they they are using the intellectual route to krishna some people may use the relational route to krishna so relational route to krishna route to krishna would mean that you know, they focus more on spending time with devotees and they want to understand they want to connect they want some counseling some guidance just some human connections and they don't want to feel judged they don't want to feel uh feel rated based on certain practices that they are doing they will say ultimately we want to have all these approaches toward krishna uh, a serious devotee has strong relationship with his devotees a serious devotee adopts many of the cultural practices a serious devotee studies the philosophy and a serious devotee also behaves in a way that is emotionally sensitive that devotee finds peace and shares peace but not everybody will be this won't be 25% 25% for everyone even when somebody is a committed devotee for some of them this the intellectual might be 80% and the remaining might be 5 5 for somebody the cultural might be 80% and the remaining might be 5 5 so what happens is we need to provide for people all these ways of coming to krishna and whether all these can be provided in one center i maybe it's possible but i it is quite difficult so the solution i see is that initial stage is at least separate it out so there's a letter of shila prabhupad where he was uh, he it's a letter he wrote to the devotees in new zealand when he was doing outreach and he said people here are quite intelligent so don't start a temple over here start a library and start a reading group over here so create a place where people can comfortably sit and read our books and discuss those books so um hari krishna it seems i've like lost audio or is it just on my end but i think it's currently off and uh, maybe he'll pop back in let's see otherwise it's like a, a massage for the soul for the mind for you know who is just like a genius <laughs> and such a soul so i can wait eternity to hear okay okay <laughs> let's just hope he will be back with us just now.
Yeah. I think he's, he's shedding some beautiful light on the intersections of, of, of culture and national consciousness, how we go about navigating that, because I know that it's something that I'm always thinking about and always experiencing. Yes, a people-centered approach is like you really have to be sensitive to the individuals and uh, try to make it easy for them to come towards Krishna. And I think it's really coming across so well in the whole presentation. Muted, Ngozi. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm speaking and I'm muted. I'm saying that I'm acknowledging um, Saradia's uh, raised hand. Uh, you can speak, Mataji. Hare Krishna, everybody. Thank you so much for organizing another very inspiring, I think, relevant session. I really appreciate that you are doing this every week. So I just wanted to say what I, what I find interesting is how he he has really thought about this very deeply. And, you know, now as he explained that, you know, different devotees come to, like, Krishna consciousness for different reasons, and it, it might be a good idea to have, you know, different programs and spaces for them and i think that is good for us because then we can some, somehow just make peace with it that you know we might not be able to accommodate everyone in everyone's need in every space but that is all right so i think that for me that is like you know good just to have that we can acknowledge this difference but at the same time we can acknowledge that that difference isn't a problem but we just find a solution how to deal with it in a constructive way because I think that's very relevant for South Africa's kind of, you know, devotee, um, the diverse devotee congregation that we have. Yes. Uh, you see Chaitanya Chan Prabhu, uh, having, you know, interacted with him, you, you understand the broadness of his approach. So it's exactly what we, whom we had to hear from. So I think Prabhu is back. And uh, so... I was showing that diagram. And the point I was making is that I uh, did you hear that point about Prabhupada in New Zealand? Where as Prabhupada said, start a library rather than a reading reading room and library rather than a temple. So the point is that overall, at least initially, we may want to have centers that uh, that focus on particular pathways for people to come to Krishna. So maybe for Africans. And for Indians, there might be different pathways that are required. And eventually, as people become more centered on Krishna, the two pathways can be integrated. Does it address the question? Yes, Prabhu. Beyond uh, uh, my happiness. Thank you. <laughs> you can see there's something in the chat. Yes, the, there is a question on the chat group, Prabhu, from um, Kamaniya Mataji. I don't know if you will read it for yourself or I can read it to you. Yeah, was it about the technicality that's fixed? You can read out the question because on the phone it's a little difficult to see. There's oh. also more if you go up. Thank you for, okay, thank uh, you for yeah. this important topic. That's the point, I think. Yes. And she uh, regarding separating the congregation from the guests, new people, was the Sunday the feast not established to be an outreach pro program, but in actual fact, it has become the weekly gathering for the congregation. Yeah. In one sense, uh, <clears throat> See, okay, this is, I wish I had the PowerPoint, but let me explain this, that our movement began as a missionary movement, where the focus was largely to become a devotee means to move into the temple. So to move into the temple. And those who were in the temple, they were attending daily Bhagavatam classes. They were also attending evening Gita classes. And in that situation, the Sunday program was for new people. So new people were defined as people largely were not staying in the temple. Because if you became a devotee, you started staying in the temple. 
So in that situation, the difference between devotees and new people was very clear. Devotees are those who are staying in the temple and new people are those who are visiting the temple and the main time for visit was the Sunday program. So in fact, the idea at that time was if somebody leaves the temple, it's almost like they're falling away. They are, they are falling away from Bhakti. Now, our movement is not temple-based so much. Uh, most people are not, not mo monks or nuns who are moving into the temples and living there. Most people have their own lives. They have their... So, uh, so because of that, so if you consider this, this was temple life and these were newcomers. So Sunday feast was a program where the newcomers would come to the temple. But now our movement has come to a place where mostly most members are already congregation members. So they don't come for the daily programs. So for them, the time to visit the temple usually is the weekend. So then what has happened is the Sunday program has become a avenue for the Sunday. The Sunday feast program has become a forum for the congregation devotees to congregate in the temple to come together <clears throat> and then because many of them are already devotees at least in a particular sense so they don't want to hear the kind of stuff that is spoken for new people because they feel like we have heard this so many times this is just basic so now for the congregation also there has to be a forum where they can come together so wh what do we do now some temples, for example, have, have, have two Sunday programs. So in India, there are several temples where the congregation primarily comes for the Sunday morning Bhagavatam class. And the Sunday feast is more for new people. So we have two programs on Sundays because Sunday is the holiday. So most of the congregation, those, that means those who are serious devotees, they may not attend the Sunday feast program at all. They attend only the Sunday morning Bhagavatam where the classes are much deeper they are for devotees who have been practicing for 10, 15, 20 years. And they are more nourishing devotionally. And then new people come for the Sunday feast program. But that has also raised some opposition. Because Prabhupada said the Sunday feast program should be the central program. So how can congregation devotees not come for the Sunday feast program? But then people have their own life. So if somebody comes on Sunday morning Bhagavatam and again come for the Sunday feast program, then they're almost there, the whole weekend is going. And they have their family right, responsibilities. They have other social obligations. How do they manage that? So in that sense, we could say the Sunday feast, we as a movement have to define what its purpose is and who is it serving. So again, the solution may probably be separation. That have a program for devotees to come together and have a program for new people to come. Many places they have they are um, some, some places started a Saturday feast program or a Saturday festival program where Saturdays are for new people and Sundays are for temple residents. So again, because uh, our movement has moved to a different place demographically, so the Sunday feast uh, purpose has to be re-envisioned. So we are, we could say, in uncharted territory as compared to what was at the Srila Prabhupada's time. And that's why things have to be adjusted. Um, Prabhu, there's one question that actually came in earlier on that I see as most other questions were coming in the chat book, um, the chat box rather might have slipped through the cracks. So it actually comes from the Wusa admin team. Um, so the question reads, um, with the rise of cannabis consumption, as per the legislation of the herb in mainstream culture, what is your take on its use by those who have formally taken to the path of bhakti or those who are practicing somewhat over a considerable period of time? Mm -hmm. I got the part about capitalistic culture. I also got the part about uh, practice, those who are practicing bhakti, but he posted about oh, I don't I see maybe I can summarize the question so the question is basically asking about cannabis so marijuana 
since it's it's becoming very popular okay. and it's, it's being less can you hear me prabhu yeah so it is the question is about cannabis yes the about, question is a yes so now again this is a little more complicated than what we normally think it to be often we say that you know drugs are like initially when prabhupad joined it was a counter culture and people were taking drugs uh chat people were taking drugs and uh, uh prabhupad said you know you can go high by drugs you give up the taking of drugs and practice bhakti which is definitely true at one level at another level it's also important to understand that uh, the idea that the spiritual can become more accessible through something material is not alien to our tradition so for example when we take prasad prasad is at one level we take sanctified food the food is itself material sanctified by a process but it's not just a sanctification we also talk about foods themselves being uh, in the modes of goodness passion ignorance so can certain food items make us more receptive to spirituality mm. we could say certainly that what we take into our body affects us uh, the most graphic way we understand this is if somebody takes a sedative is go to sleep so it's a substance we may take a pill or we may take an injection so what we now when we go to sleep we are becoming unconscious so a physical input can take our consciousness down consciousness down so that's that the principle of intoxication now it's clear that physical substances can take our consciousness down so can physical substances take our consciousness up also well why not if they can take it down they can take it up also so we ourselves may experience that certain foods may energize us more now of course you can say that energization is temporary like when people are feeling sleepy they may take caffeine and they may feel they may take coffee and they may feel more energized by that their sleep goes away their lethargy goes away now that is that has its own harmful health effects in the long run just to be acknowledged so if we consider the mode of the the mode of ignorance the mode of passion that the mode of goodness then there is there is there is transcendence and then there is krishna so i would say krishna exists at the summit of transcendence so there are five levels ignorance passion goodness transcendence and the summit of transcendence krishna so certain food items can raise people's consciousness by which maybe they become more receptive to spiritual insights maybe they they feel their mind is becoming clearer and now having said that so within our tradition now that there were sages in the especially in the shaivite tradition they would take ganja and cannabis is considered in some ways like ganja some ways different i won't go into the specifics over here but uh, the idea of taking substance the, the, the idea that what we take physically in affects our consciousness is intrinsic to our tradition it is obvious also in terms of certain substances taking us down taking our consciousness down so certain substances may take the consciousness up also having said that uh, the possibility is there the possibility is fraught with many dangers one danger is of course that a person may get get addicted and they may go from something which is relatively harmless substance addiction can go from something harmless to something far more harmful in fact uh, in america drugs are a epidemic they are a national emergency in many parts of the world many parts of america and the way people get hooked to drugs is often a very harmless way that means they may have some very painful surgery if somebody has falls and has a thigh surgery then people are given some pain medication for that and that pain medication makes them feel good and eventually they keep taking the pain medication even after the pain stops because it makes them feel good 
and that's how they may they, they may develop dependency so the opioid epidemic as you rightly pointed out kamini mataji that is true so now the opioid epidemic doesn't always result because people went out of their way to take drugs it may start by simply taking prescription pills on which people become dependent eventually and they may become terribly dependent so that the possibility of spiraling down into addiction is there that danger is very much there then secondly for people they may get some high through certain use certain use of certain substances but that high may lead to even if it doesn't lead to addiction it may have destructive physical consequences in the long run um it may just affect the body negatively thirdly is that through such substances though somebody might get spiritual insights they might get many other things which are not spiritual insights it is a hallucinations so knowing what is actually a spiritual insight and what is just a hallucination what is just a person mistaking something to be a spiritual insight that is quite difficult to discern so so we could say no, that if somebody claims to somebody is habituated to taking it and somebody claims to have become spiritually more receptive or become spiritually more they've been in insight through it i don't think we need to reject or condemn that at least in the initial stages because if that's what has brought them to explore spirituality then that's fine <coughs> but if you contextualize it explain it so explain the challenges the dangers within it so what bhakti yoga offers us is a pathway for gaining spiritual insight which is free from these hazards so in one sense substances can make us more spiritually receptive but there are also many dangers associated with it and in the tradition yes there were sadhus who would take ganja and other stuff like that but those who did that uh, often they themselves would become degraded at times and that's why that was only one if, if at all ganja or the substances like that were taken by some some shaivites that was only one part of their spiritual practice they would also be austere sages who would who would they would do austerities fast chant the names of shiva or whatever so that might be if that is one part of a spiritual practice that is i would say much that is what it was in the tradition and there is a significant level of safety in that because all the other things that they are doing they are scripture based that that is also purifying them that also uh, that also making them more spiritually receptive and insight giving them spiritual insight so drugs alone i think it is hazardous that there is a potential and if we dismiss that potential we can alienate a lot of people but uh, but if we don't contextualize and explain the dangers then we may be we will, we will be doing a disservice so drugs can't take one to krishna directly nobody will get just by taking drugs uh, like a pure love for krishna but through some some things if people get some experiences which make them feel good which make, make them feel like exploring something higher in their lives you know we we can see that maybe this is the way krishna is clearing the path for them to come to him but this is not this is something more transitional this is not something permanent so that would be my understanding does it address the question um yes yes they have indicated yes on on, on the group problem so yes thank you sardhya mata ji for your comment i think the broad mindedness is just a result of having my mind blown out many times by seeing how i thought that that this person just cannot be krishna conscious the way they are living the way they are speaking what they are doing and then actually i put aside my filter and talk with them i see that they are so deeply conscious of krishna so that's what i mean it's the road to becoming broad minded is not so easy so so i also have my or spot so i would say that uh, we all need to learn but yes i'm happy to be of some service so uh, thank you for the opportunity it's almost been 2 hours and i'm sorry for the small 
technical hitch in between but it is a very for me also very stimulating discussion there's a lot of earnest questions and uh, i'm i'm happy that all of you are also thinking seriously about the challenges that are there in trying to share krishna bhakti and i hope that i could share some insights which can help you in your challenging service there thank you very much krishna prabhu pad ki jai jai कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन thank you for happy to your service great so these are my website geeta daily is where i write an article on the geeta every day in fact i would say 70 80% of what i spoke there are already articles on the geeta daily about these themes and then the spiritual scientist is there mostly my lectures and question answers are there and monks podcast is where i have discussions with senior priests about various issues that are that are confronting us in our practice and in our sharing of krishna bhakti so these are online resources that are available if any of you would like to access them thank you hare krishna hare hare krishna, hare krishna prabhu hare krishna <laughs> <laughs> so um actually it's already on the screen uh prabhu can be found on the world wide web at www.gitadaily.com as well as www.thespiritualscientist.com where he can be contacted um you can also subscribe to his youtube channel at the monks uh, podcast uh furthermore please kindly visit like share and follow us on social media platforms that include facebook instagram and youtube at wusa108 please help us get to 1000 followers and subscriptions and even more um thank you so much for your support we are happy to announce that our morning japa sessions are back that details um around the daily program will be communicated on um, in the wusa weekly whatsapp group um you can join the wusa weekly whatsapp group via the link at www.wusa.online to receive regular activity updates and communications uh the link is on on the chat panel uh very importantly this group is only used for quick um announcements and it will be not used for spam only admins are able to post on the group we are also very happy and excited to announce that our books um that our books are the basis of club is up and running please catch us every thursday evening um for a jam packed reading and sharing of your realizations um sessions via zoom we are also elated to announce that we have the heart to heart vaishnav circle is happening every friday from 6:30 pm to 7:30 pm standard south african time with her grace mother raj uh, leela uh via zoom you can visit that also through www.wusa.online to find out more about this um join the wusa weekly whatsapp group to keep updated and participate in all of the exciting programs that i've just um given to you um on that note a quick a quick update on the fundraiser for the wusa preaching initiative is that the sankirtan bus has been ticked off the wusa wish list and the wusa house yoga studio is near in completion we thank all who opened their hearts to us and have donated towards this preaching effort um the bus and now the studio i guess you can say were amongst the first items on the wish list that we need to mobilize for our preaching effort uh we still have quite a bit of have uh, to go uh please yet again visit um www.wusa.online to download the wish list from our donations page on our site and for more information you are welcome to contact us uh via email at admin@wusa.online 
Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Yo, yo, what? Check it. Uh huh. Yeah. Thought I was a boy and a warm wall roof associating with books. Now that the table's been turned, look who's the greater fool. Hare Krishna. Uh, the first time people finally did the, the, the devotees, mainly here in Pretoria Temple, Kiti Lego Mata, who meditated. Then they introduced me to Japa. I tried it, Dampala, I came back and tried it with them, it was fun, nice, so I decided to take it. Then, the, the day when I came back, Nonale Maharaj, like he introduced this section in the Bible, Enigirata, from Vanity Karma. The book was Vanity Karma. Anyway, and even like, uh, like different things and the negatives like there's a time to kill a time to mourn time to be born time to die so it made sense to know uh, like then i decided to stay with the devotees to java which is nice and krishna <laughs> Gets hard and all keeps failing If you try As you dream of something better Your strength will shake and waver And you lose your faith in things that well your life Schoolers Ooh, sir Wake up South Africa South Africa You've been sleeping far too long Wake up South Africa Now come along and sing this song Wake up South Africa